inside what talks were giving in the, in the winter, the extension educators at Penn State, they are the ones that sort of, they keep their ear to the ground as far as what's going on. And, and copper has been a real big, a big topic over the last year, especially, and in general. So hopefully you'll be able to walk away from this talk with a few nuggets of wisdom of how copper works, how, as far as how it works and how you can utilize it for disease management. So as far as how my talk is going to go, an outline. Uh, first, under, understanding exactly how does copper work by itself. Factors that impact the efficacy of using copper sprays. And the next one, this is very important, understanding copper injury. Because, and I, I, this probably won't be the last time I'll say it, copper is a general biocide and you're going to get injury regardless, unfortunately. The goal is to try to mitigate that injury by understanding how pH plays a role. And then finally, the basic do's and don'ts of using copper. And then finally, we'll go into using copper for disease management, focusing on apple scab fire blight, peach leaf curl, bacterial canker for folks that have cherries in here, that's a big problem, and finally, bacterial spot. Okay, copper. As I mentioned, copper is a general biocide, meaning it's non-selective. It's going to attack plant cells, it's going to attack fungal cells, it's going to attack bacterial cells. It acts as a protectant, and as a result, uh, you need to apply copper prior to the infection event. Uh, so when you're using it as a fungicide or bactericide, it needs to go on ahead of time. There's no post-infection activity since it is a protectant because it's just lying right on the surface. And that's why I like my little phrase that it sticks where it hits. The copper is going to be sticking where it's hitting on the leaf surface and you don't have any redistribution after it's been applied. So while it's on the leaf, for copper, it requires moisture to be present on the leaf surface in order to co for copper to be active. So when you, when you have the leaf surface, there is some moisture, but plants also secrete, secrete some exudates that create an acidic environment, and you need that slightly acidic environment on the leaf surface combined with the leaf moisture in order for copper particles to release their ions. So copper particles gradually disintegrate into their copper, um, into their cop in order to release the copper ions. And so as a result, it's as far as copper is most effective for managing diseases that require that as far as a level of, of wetness or free water present. And so that is why certain diseases seem to spawn, respond really well to uh, copper. And as far as how it works is that when the copper particles are releasing those ions, they're going to be targeting key enzymes and whether it's unfortunately plant cells if they're nearby, uh, bacterial cells or fungal cells. When those copper ions attack the enzymes, it's going to be disrupting some key function and then you get death of the organism. So what the, what's the challenge? The challenge is that you want the copper present uh, in order to kill your target, so your fungal organism or your bacterial organism, while keeping the concentration of copper um, low enough in order to avoid injury on the plant surface. And so you want to be using coppers that are relatively insoluble in water. So, they, so the copper ions aren't being released all at once. It's the copper ions that are doing, that are doing the job as far as killing things. So understanding solubility versus insolubility when it comes to copper. Soluble coppers, we're talking about bluestone copper, copper sulfate or copper sulfate pentahydrate, it's also known as. Soluble means that the copper ions are released all at once. They aren't copper particles. They're, they're just the free ions of the copper. So that when they're on the surface of the plant tissue, they're available all the time there. But a downside of soluble coppers is, is that you can have the residues of the copper be washed away or blown away very easily. And as far as how this looked, looks, as far as a, a cartoon of this, is that here we have, we have sprayed bluestone copper on a leaf, we have a wetting event such as rain, and boom, all the copper ions are released all at once. They're all available. In contrast to low soluble coppers or insoluble coppers, these are our fixed coppers. We're talking about Coside, Champ, Nordox, Quava. The list could go on. These are fixed coppers. 
And so when you're spraying a fixed copper, you're actually spraying a suspension of copper particles, the copper particles themselves. And these particles will persist on the leaf surface. And when the leaf surface is wet, those particles will gradually release the ions in order to do, in order to be able to manage whatever disease or could be present on the leaf. There's residual protection as a result of this when you have the copper particles there. What this means is that the copper particles aren't going, aren't going to be releasing all of their ions at once. It's a gradual release. So you can have copper particles that can be persisting, and as it's persisting, it'll gradually release their ions. And so as a result of this residual protection, you have less phytotoxicity because all of the copper ions aren't being released at once. And how this would look is that if we are spraying our solution of copper, we have a wedding event, the copper ions, some of the copper ions released, another wedding event, you have more copper ions released. So it's gradual release of the copper ions as opposed to the soluble where you have all of the ions available at once. Now the solubility of fixed coppers can vary to make this even more confusing, but just to kind of, uh, this is just to illustrate that the solu insoluble coppers, they aren't all created equally. So as our example up here of a copper that's 100% soluble in water, we have bluestone here, copper sulfate pentahydrate, an example of a soluble copper is master cop. Now we have our fixed coppers here. So fixed coppers are partially soluble in water, and some are more soluble in water than <coughs> others. So in the case of copper hydroxide, this is more soluble in water than, say, cuprous oxide or basic copper sulfate. This is much less soluble in water. And then right in the middle, we have COC, copper oxychloride, which is kind of right in the middle of solubility in water. When you add lime, this actually increases the insolubility of the copper. It makes it really more fixed, where the copper ions aren't being able to be released. So if you add lime to bluestone, you're making Bordeaux, and when you're adding lime to a soluble copper, you're actually making it fixed because the lime is tying up those copper ions and preventing them from being available all at once. Another thing to note that not all copper is blue. Some copper is rusty colored in the case of Nordox. And another thing to note is that you hear me talk about basic copper sulfate, copper sulfate, copper sulfate pentahydrate. Well, one thing to remember is that basic copper sulfate and copper sulfate are two different things. Basic copper sulfate is a fixed copper. Copper sulfate, which is also known as copper sulfate pentahydrate, this is a, a, this is a soluble copper. So sometimes you may hear people using these interchangeably. When we're talking about a fixed copper sulfate, usually basic is in front of that, so it's basic copper sulfate. So just file that in the back of your mind um, when you're hearing people or you hear me talk to say <coughs> copper sulfate. Now, as far as the efficacy of copper, it de will depend on two <coughs> things. The first is the amount of um, elemental copper that's in the product. And we call this the percent metallic copper content. And here we have a list, this isn't a complete list, but this list of, of coppers will make sense later on. Um, but we have a list of coppers here, and as you can see, the percent of metallic copper content can vary between the different products here. And the percent of metallic copper is the amount of copper that's, that's within the act, how much available copper is in the active ingredient. So as you can see that soluble coppers, in the case of master cop and copper count N, they really have a very low metallic copper content. And that is because if it had a high, such as like say 50%, it would completely torch any plant tissue because of that amount of freely available copper ions that are present. So when you're looking at different coppers, you wanna be mindful of the percent metallic copper content and that's listed right on the label of the product. Product. The other factor that has an effect on efficacy is particle size. So copper particle size, this is determined by how finely ground the copper compound is. You can't tell just by looking at it. This is something we're talking on a microscopic level here. When you have large particles, they don't cover the leaf as well. 
Uh, and as a result, you can see here that you've got large copper particles and they, aren't, you don't, they don't cover the surface area very well. And as a result of these bigger particles, they are easily removed by wind or rain, especially after the leaf surface is dry. In contrast to small particles, the smart particles, which are depicted right here, is that they can have a, more of an ability to cover the leaf surface. And that's because you have more smart particles per pound. And so you have better spray coverage as a result. And since you've got better coverage of the leaf, these particles are able to adhere to the leaf much better. And since they're able to adhere to the leaf much better, these particles are going to have a much longer ability, as far as a longer residue period on the leaf tissue in order for um, the copper particles to be able to release those copper ions when you want them to. And then we're back to this slide where we looked at the percent metallic copper. And over here, we have the mean particle size. And I apologize for the blanks. I could not find that information in time. But the overall take home message here is that the copper particles vary. And for the soluble coppers here for copper count N and master cop, you see the particle size is zero. The reason why it's zero is that it's a soluble copper. There are no particles in that soluble copper. It's just the free copper ions. Okay, and the, okay, I skipped a slide. All right, so now as far as understanding, uh, you know, what to keep in mind when you're using copper products on tree fruits, um, on apples and on peaches and cherries and pears. And finally, the do's and don'ts as far as to minimize copper injury. The, really, the most important thing you need to remember is that coppers, solubility of fixed coppers they increases under acidic conditions. What does that mean? Is that if you have an acidic solution, you throw in your copper particles are in there, they'll be able to release those copper ions much faster. Remember, the goal is not to have all those copper ions released all at once. We want the gradual release of copper ions. So acidity, pH, is very, very important when it comes to dealing with copper and spraying copper effectively. So it's very important to check the pH of your, of your spray solution. What's the pH of your spray water? And it's also you have to keep in mind is what else are you putting in that spray solution? I recommend and I advocate spraying copper separately. I know this is more of a hassle, but you really, you really increase your chances by adding more stuff to that solution as far as increasing the chance for phytotoxicity of the copper. So adjuvants like Li700, that's an acidifier. That will drop the pH. Foliar fertilizers or phosphonate, at, phosphonate products like Rampart or Phosphorol or Prophyte. There are some coppers that clearly state on their label, do not combine with a foliar fertilizer. And the reason why is that the way these foliar fertilizers work or the way the phosphorus acid products work is that they want to penetrate into the leaf tissue. And if they're penetrating into the leaf tissue and you mix copper with that, what else is attempting to penetrate into the leaf tissue? But the copper particles, the copper ions. And so you'll get greater damage of leaf tissue as a result. And it's very difficult to see here, but this little peach tree looks like a Christmas tree because copper, unfortunately, was inappropriately used in this case. Copper was mixed with a bunch of different things, one of them including a foliar fertilizer. And there was severe phytotoxicity of this tree as a result. When you have severe phytotoxicity, the leaves are they're dropped to the ground. You get smaller fruit as a result. You're going to be also stressing your tree out. So you can use copper, and the, the tree can be able to withstand some phytotoxicity, but not this extreme when they're losing all their leaves. Also keep in mind mancozeb as well. Mancozeb will also drop the pH of the solution. Now, we, now, as far as the pH of coppers, to add another layer of complexity, all coppers aren't equal in their, the pH of their solution. So we asked this question in the lab last summer. We were wondering about, well, you know, pH plays a big role in copper. I was seeing more phytotoxicity with some products over others, so I wanted to understand why. So we tested our water at pH 7, which is neutral. We looked at Quava, because we were looking at Quava in the field, and the pH of Quava in this solution was 6.52. 
When you add double nickel to it, which is a biological, it, the pH barely changes. So this tells me that even adding a biological to copper will not really act as a safener for the copper because the pH isn't changing. Now, if that double nickel was a little more basic and increased the pH, it's a different story. But in this case, with or without double nickel, the pH is very similar. When you add lime to it, you have your pH jumps up as expected. Lime is basic, so it's going to increase your pH. Master cop is quite low. Remember, master cop is soluble. And so soluble, as far as a soluble copper, I would anticipate this, this copper being a little more acidic. When you add lime, that increases the pH. And I tested this master cop in lime one year, um, two summers ago, and I actually noticed less phytotoxicity and I saw great control for bacterial spot. So this is something to think about as far as adding lime. Another thing to think about if you choose to use lime, when you have your spray solution, do not mix insecticides with it because insecticides are going to be influenced by lime by that basic nature. Just apply them separately. So if lime is something you're considering as far as adding to your copper to add more disease control or mitigating phytotoxicity, leave insecticides, spray sec insecticides separately. And then finally, coside. Now this was a really interesting thing, is coside 7.52. And if you add cosite and lime, it's 12. Cooper, Cooperfix Ultra is also around 7.34. Out in the field on peaches, on my peach trees in Biglerville, I noticed less phytotoxicity when I used cosite compared to Cueva. In the same exact block, I used them the same exact way, similar concentrations. And so I was really curious as far as like, why was this? Why was I seeing more phytotoxicity using Cueva? Well, now I understand why, is that the pH of the two copper solutions were very different. One was definitely more neutral than the other. So this would explain that why Coside uh, is less phytotoxic to the tree. This may go against, as far as what you may have heard about Cueva being, Cueva is a copper soap, it's not as phytotoxic. Well. Maybe in certain situations, but in the case of peach trees, it was a little more phytotoxic. Uh, so it's being mindful of, of the amount, if you choose to use Cueva, just being mindful of the amount that you use. Okay, now as far as other, other do's and don'ts, being mindful of slow drying conditions. Remember, copper ions, copper particles. Cop the copper ions are dependent upon those copper particles being wet in order for be released. If you have slow drying conditions, similar to what we had in Pennsylvania last year and why that poor little peach tree was suffered, it never dried out. So you, if you did spray copper, you had this constant release of the copper ions from those particles. As a result, phytotoxicity can be worsened. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you're applying dormant applications, be careful of if frost is predicted, especially if there's some green tissue present. If you have some damage to that green tissue as a result of frost and copper particles are present, this could cause even more damage because that injury will allow entry, an entry point for those copper particles. Mm -hmm. And also, another thing um, to keep in mind as far as enhancing the residual, residual activity during dormancy when you apply a dormant copper, as far as if anyone uses oil, applying oil for mic control, combining copper and oil at dormancy, just at dormancy, seems to allow the copper particles to hang around a bit more. So those copper particles will be more efficacious as the season kind of creeps along. So the copper particles are there, say, when something, a fungus or a bacteria comes along, which we'll discuss in a minute. But of course, when you're applying oil, it's always temperature sensitive. Now, this isn't something you would do during the season. This is just as far as a dormant spray. OK, so now is a good segue into disease management. You want to be able to apply a copper residue that's going to be persisting for a little bit in the sense of when, when there's going to be fungal activity and also bacterial activity. The idea is, is that if you have leftover cankers, fire blight cankers in your tree, they start oozing, that there is a layer of copper particles there for the ooze to hit as, it, as the canker starts waking up. When it hits that, when those, the ooze, the bacterial ooze, hits that copper, it's killed, and it drops the number of bacterial cells that are available to be able to cause disease. So that is, that's the prevailing idea with applying a dormant spray 
of copper to manage both apple scab and fire blight. And you want to aim for two pounds of copper to the acre. And as far as figuring that out, um, I'm using COSI 3000 as an example here. Now this is a dry, this is a dry product, not liquid. If you want to figure out a liquid, the liquid formulation, you need to contact me and I'll figure it out for you because it's a little different. Uh, it's not as straightforward as when you're dealing with a dry product. So COSI 3000, metallic copper equivalent is 30%. My metallic copper um, content or my metallic rate that I want is two pounds to the acre. I divide that by 0.3. That's 30, 30% is 30 over 100. So that's 0.3. And I get about six pounds to the acre. If you're using a dry formulation, you can use that equation right there. Just make your percent into point whatever, and you'll be able to get your um, how much of uh, product you will need. Again, liquid coppers, it's a different calculation email me and I'll figure it out for you. Um, you want to be careful about dry years because copper, of course, russets, which I believe is the next slide. Yes, copper injury. Of course, copper can cause injury to the tree. This is an example of copper injury, of using copper not quite the most optimal way. Uh, copper injury can also result in burned edges, but the big thing is that it can cause russeting on russet sensitive cultivars. In the case for stone fruit diseases, uh, co a dormant copper spray, spray is great for peach leaf curl. This is, dormancy is the only time that you can manage peach leaf curl because once the leaves are out, they cover the spores and the spores, the fungal spores are protected. Copper is a great way for knocking back peach leaf curl fungi. In the case of bacterial canker, using a Bordeaux mixture for anyone who struggles with bacterial canker on cherry, you can use a Bordeaux mixture, which is, again, copper sulfate pentahydrate and lime. And this is an example. I've talked about this before. If you want a good article, Google Win Kogel here, Win Kogel Rutgers bacterial canker, and he wrote this great article as far as using Bordeaux mixture. And you will use this mixture in the fall and the spring. So if you have cherry trees that are suffering from bacterial canker, you want to focus on this one down here. As far as using five pounds of copper sulfate pentahydrate, uh, seven pounds of lime in 100 gallons with some oil. And the oil is thought to be a a safener, but I think it's more as far as allowing the product to stick to the tree a bit better with that idea that if the bacterial canker is oozing, it's going to be hitting that copper and it, it's going to be able to knock back the bacterial population. Um, two things to keep in mind is that this, yes, this is a mess. This is a very messy uh, concoction. So as far as the best way to do it is Fill your tank half full of water, add agitation, add the copper, the lime, then the oil. It is messy, I understand, but there are folks that absolutely swear by this. The other thing, too, is that you want to use a fresh hydrated lime because the freshness of the hydrated lime also plays a factor in this. Okay, as far as bacterial spot, you start at petal fall shuck split, so you can use a lower rate of copper, and it's based on whatever copper you use. And then you can use it as cover sprays as well to manage bacterial spot. And if you want this, if you, and I apologize for not having this, if you want this slide here, email me, kap22, and I will email it to you so you don't have to worry about scribbling down, um, scribbling down rates. But the gist of this slide is that here are all the different coppers that are labeled for stone fruit, peach and nectarine, to be able to use these coppers as cover sprays. And what Dr. Norma Lancet at Rutgers determined is that you can use a rate of the copper at 0.5 ounces to the acre of the metallic copper, and you'll have a, you'll decrease your chances of phytotoxicity, but at the same time you'll be able to still get control bacterial spot on your fruit. You can increase that rate to one ounce to the acre of metallic copper you get a little bit more of phytotoxicity, but you'll get even cleaner fruit. So this is, these are adjusted rates because what the label rate is, sometimes it's way too extreme and it will just burn your tree. So he figured out the rates as far as at this 0.5 ounces and it seems to work very well. Okay, and as far as copper injury, this is very important because people, they sometimes mistake copper injury for bacterial spot. So it's hard to see here, but there's lots of holes. 
for copper injury. You can have purpling, or like purple spots. You can have the tips of the leaves being necrotic. And it's very hard to tell. But this is bacterial spot. And the way to tell bacterial spot is that the lesions are always angular. Always, always, always angular. They follow the veins of the leaf. So think A in bacteria, A angular. You can have yellowing associated with the leaves. It doesn't take much, many lesions for the leaves to yellow, and it doesn't take many lesions for the leaves to defoliate. In contrast to copper injury, it looks like Swiss cheese. There are round holes, round like a water droplet. Think the O in round, the O in copper for the mnemonic. Uh, yellowing's not always associated. That's why the trees look rough, is that the leaves will be hanging on, but they won't fall off. And this, in the defoliation, if you do get defoliation, it's primarily on the older leaves because you're getting that buildup of copper particles on those older leaves. So they stand to have a greater chance of defoliation and phytotoxicity on those older leaves. Another thing to keep in mind is that captain and sulfur, they can also cause similar injuries. But again, if the circles are perfectly round, it looks like a spray pattern, <coughs> chances are this is uh, a chemical injury. Okay, we're at the very end as far as the take home messages. Just keep in mind that with different coppers, the solubilities are different, especially between fixed and bluestone. You want to keep in mind the percent of metallic copper content of the product that you're using. Solubility of coppers increase under acidic conditions. Be mindful of what your, of what your spray water is, of what are you adding to that spray water and especially if it creates an acidic environment. That's not a good sign for, or it's not a good thing for copper. Be mindful of slow drying conditions. If it's going to be raining every other day for three weeks and you are suffering from bacterial spot, you do not want to be using copper during that time. You want to be using something else, such as oxytetracycline or, or, um, or Serenade Optimum or some other product. You may want to avoid copper for a while because the slow drying conditions can just make matters worse. Uh, as far as just being mindful of green tissue that could be showing uh, right before, if there's a frost, uh, adding oil for mite control, and that can help with the residual activity of copper. And as far as using dormant copper sprays, these work. So if you aren't a user of dormant copper sprays to manage these diseases, consider becoming a convert. These do work. And then finally, for the cover sprays for bacterial spot, uh, the 0.5 ounces to the acre based on that table. If you would like it, email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. And that, whew, mm -hmm. I think of like a minute left. <laughs> Two minutes, according <coughs> to Carrie. Yes. Carrie, on your dormant spray on peaches, when do you put that on? Uh, I would. At that stage. <laughs> As slightly, not quite, not quite when it's showing the pink, but you. Yeah, I wouldn't call that dormant. Well, no, well, that's as, that was that was like that was the closest I could get. You want it as far as you don't want the buds to be that swollen, but as far as like a dormant period would be before those buds really swell. Um, that's actually pretty. That's actually beyond the dormant time. But so you want it before then. So as for around here, I would say probably early April would be a dormant, would be a good dormant spray, especially if you're trying to combat um, peach leaf curl. The sooner the better. And you can, you can also do that dormant spray in the fall too after all the leaves have fallen off. Okay, March. Mid-March. Before the maples start blooming. Before the maples start blooming. the maples start to bloom and you haven't got your dormant spray on your peaches, you better get moving. Yeah. <laughs> Real, uh, honestly, any time. I mean, if I mean, really, like today would be a great day to put on your dormant spray. You know, I mean, it's as long as the trees are dormant. Here are the questions. Is it going to be affected if there's a frost the next day or that time? Well, if there's no green tissue there, you don't have to worry about it because it's the the whole point of putting on a, a dormant spray is there's it's the tree still dormant. It shouldn't, no, it shouldn't. It, you only have to worry about is for sometimes when you spray a dormant copper spray with apple, some people stretch the delay, they call it delayed dormant, where there may be a little bit of green tissue that's poking through on apples. 
that's where, that's where you could run into trouble. But for peaches, if you do it like right now, you're fine. It's not going to be a problem. I, we raise I red apples and you're susceptible to fire. Yep, they are. We've had some big pump strikes. Strike. Now, I've been mixing coastline five pounds <coughs> or five gallons and taking a paintbrush and doing those big strikes. Do you think, do you think it's doing any good? Do you want, do you want my honest answer? <laughs> okay, when you, if you have, you, you said you have a, a canker or a strike in the trunk. Yes. Yeah, that tree has no chance. And the reason why it's in the trunk, so what's going to happen is that no matter what you do, I mean, you can try to slow it down, but that canker is going to continue growing the next season. When it's growing, that bacteria is also growing with it. And that bacteria is going to be moving inside the tree to growing parts. So you might see shoot blight as a result of that canker. So the shoot blight actually starts at the base of the shoot, then going to the tip. In contrast to what we think of typical shoot blight is when it's like you see it at the tip first, and then it goes down the shoot. In the case of something like a trunk strike, which actually it may not be it may have been, you may have had a residual canker in there and new shoots have grown out and it may have actually gotten affected as a result of that residual canker in the tree. But when you have cankers in your trunk, you have to start having a, a moment with yourself thinking, is this going to be worth hanging on to this tree? Because it's going to be a constant fight when it's in the trunk. But I can't make that decision for you. I can only tell you what to anticipate to happen. Five or six years. We started out with shoot light and then we got ahead. Yeah. But it seems to work. They don't seem to get any larger. But I, I know what you're saying about it getting systemic. Yeah. Apogee, like if you if your trees are still producing, which I totally understand that, it's like I'm still getting a good crop, apogee. That will help sort of mitigate creating new cankers in the trees and also spread. So that would shut the tree down as far as, or slowing it down so that bacteria doesn't get around. So I would embrace Apogee in, those, in that situation. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, all the way. So when Bill leaves here and goes and cuts that tree down, <laughs> can he replace the tree right there? Is that okay? Is that going to be something yes. He can replace the tree right there. Um, you don't have to worry about fire blight spreading through the roots. That's, that's okay. It's fungal diseases you have to worry about in the roots, but fire blight, no, there's no worry. <laughs> if you're separating your tanks and you put a spray you can put the copper on in one day, yep. and so you come back two or three days later with a cap tan or some foliar feed, is it going to give you that white top on the leaf surface? It depends. It depends on how much rain has fallen in between times. I mean, there, there is a chance, especially if there's res residual there. That's, that's the thing, that's what you risk, is if there's, if there's residual material on that leaf and you come in with copper or especially a foliar feed or foliar fertilizer, you know, it, it's, a t it's, a, it's a tricky situation. It will all depend on how much rain. Well, in that case, no. It only helps to separate sprays as if with insecticides. It's as if you, you're adding lime. That when I mentioned about separating the sprays, in that case, it's 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 a tough situation because I've I've been asked that question as far as like foliar fertilizers and spraying copper. And the thing is that copper resides on the leaf tissue quite a long time. So you could be enhanced. There's a potential of enhancing the phytotoxicity, especially if you add a foliar fertilizer where its tendency is to be sucked right into the leaf tissue. So you're going to probably have to use your judgment on timing. Uh, of timing of when things have been sprayed and how much rain has fallen to wash stuff off. So, yeah. Good. Thanks very much.